how far have we come? In 1976, I told my mother I was gay and she cried for two weeks after that. When I came out, I saw a very limited horizon for myself. There were no states that prohibited gay marriage. They didn't because no one ever imagined that was something that would ever exist. There were still red lights and bars to tell you that the police were coming so you could get out of the gay bar in time so you wouldn't get arrested. Uh, I've heard more and more stories, the kinds of pain and the amount of time and therefore money that is spent covering up lives and, and, and not being who they are. By being out and standing up and being counted, we have created opportunities for our community that didn't exist when we were all molding in the closet. I mean, these conferences serve, I believe, as a meaningful tool for introspection, but also forward-thinking analysis, developing an agenda that we think could potentially be effective in bringing about change. To be able to go and love and have kids and be married to whoever you want to and not be hurt physically or legally simply because of who you are is something we've always understood as, as a firm from the first days we were a firm. For me, the importance of self-identification to my own personal growth and how it affects my entire community is key and central to why I wake up every day. As a leader at Greenberg Traurig, if I believe in the concept of diversity and inclusion, it can't be enough just to say those things. You have to do those things, and that's why I'm here today. I absolutely couldn't miss this conference. Maintaining systems that support asymmetrical marriage laws, and the cost of all that bureaucracy is more than a billion dollars a year in the U.S., and that's just foolish. It's a waste of money. And so doing the right thing here has a, a business advantage, too. Virtually every American, including every single one of the Supreme Court justices, has a friend or a relative or a law clerk or a neighbor who just happens to be gay. And it's virtually impossible, I think, to come up with one decent reason for why or how it's okay to discriminate against them under the law. And that's in large part due to people like you, Art, uh, because you were fighting this fight, you know, when I was still deeply in the closet trying to make partner. When I arrived in New York as a young attorney in the 1970s, and there weren't many out attorneys. That's why I started what became the Gay Bar Association here in New York. But ultimately, I don't think we achieve much if we stay in the closet and don't press forward on the issues that are important to us. One of the things that it was incumbent for me to try to do was to establish that a gay judge could handle these issues the same way that some other judge would handle the issues. Being gay on the bench does not mean that you're going to slant your decisions one way or the other. So when a young law student sees someone like Alfonso, or some of you in the audience, all of a sudden, what might have seemed like an impossibility suddenly becomes real. And it has a name, and it has a face. And the name is your name, and the face is your face. So when I sit in meetings like today, it often reduces me to tears because I see how very far we've come, yet, how much more we have to do. You're on the wrong side of history if you don't support every effort to equalize and make it okay to be who you are. And we're not there yet. <laughs>